All right, so we're back. And Zach B. Sane asks, have dwarves ever warred with non-corrupted humans? All the time. All the time. Uh, perceived slights due to cultural differences, wanting to mine or harvest certain resources from, like, sacred sites to the humans, or maybe they're, like, going to wage war against the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandson of a thief who stole something from the dwarf in question. Um, like, dwarves go to war with humans that are, like, not evil all the time. Because, um, remember, if you die, if you're a man, for instance, or anybody, for that matter, it could be a dwarf or a man, if you die and there's a grudge against you, the dwarves will simply pass that grudge onto your next of kin or, like, the closest thing you have to next of kin and that grudge is not settled until the dwarves have done something about it so i mean there there is a there's a story in the masters of stone and steel omnibus about the dwarves of zuffbar going to settle a grudge against a man who who's like something something great grandfather um abandoned them during a battle like there was a battle with a bunch of green skins and he was supposed to hold the flank and he ran away because the green skin army was too big and he was like oh shit i'm getting out of here and the dwarves went to war with his something something great grandson because they were like uh we're here to reclaim reparations for you abandoning us and the humans were basically like who <laughs> um like they will do that crap all the time so yeah dwarves will go to war with humans no problem like even in total war warhammer there's a mission you can get that's been in since uh, the first game, like the base release. There's a mission you can get to raid a certain empire region because there was a super famous story about a uh, empire. Um, uh, uh, it wasn't an electric count. It was some like lord, um, provincial lord or something of an area wanted the dwarves to build him a fortress. So they did and he paid them. And the dwarves went home and they counted all the, they counted all the, pe the money and they realized that they were like one penny short, literally like a penny. And instead of like, I don't know, sending an ambassador to the dude and being like, Hey, you didn't pay us exactly what you promised. We need another penny. The dwarves were like, well, he didn't pay us enough. And they went back and burned it down. <laughs> like they just leveled the fortress. So there you go. Uh, Neb or something asks, oh, do dwarves have the means to get rid of orc mushrooms, like the fungus that grows into green skins over time? Do they burn it or scrape it up or use it for something? Uh, fire. Yes. Lots and lots and lots of fire. Uh, they will burn that crap to the, they will incinerate it. Uh, sometimes they'll mix it up with like explosions or cave-ins, but usually fire. <laughs> That'll take care of it. Uh, Eye of Tomato asks, I'd like to know something about Belagar and the ancestors that he has in the campaign. I know who King Loon is, but what about the other three? So, the we will talk about them a bit in the... Uh, God, I am so behind on some projects now that I'm saying it out loud. But the... Um, so, Scarsnick... Or, sorry, Quick Head Taker's video is being worked on. Um, this the, I kind of hit, like, writer's block with the script, but I'm really hoping to finish it super, super soon. Um, but, uh, when, after Queek Headtaker's video, we're doing the ancient history of Karakate Peaks, will, which will be very easy to write because it's super straightforward. And the ancient history of Karakate Peaks will cover, like, all of the stories of how the original hold fell and a little bit after that. And you will learn about those characters. Long story short is that, um, the other Thane, um, so not King Lun, but the other one, um, uh, was he was essentially the gatekeeper of Karakate Peaks when it fell. Um, and his death is very, very famous. Um, and then the other two, Throny Ironbrow, who is the uh, ghostly runesmith. I'm pretty sure he's just a reference to Thoric Ironbrow. Um, and then the engineer um, ghost, I have no idea. Um, I, I, I don't think he's from... I don't think he's from a specific source. I literally think um that creative assembly when they looked at it was just like all right we need like we want to make the ancestors like actual characters like four ghosts that are unbreakable and like give you an advantage so your campaign can be really hard um and two of like the two thanes are from the actual store history of Karak eight peaks and the other two are maybe references but they seem like they were just pulled out of thin air i don't know them um 
anyway, so back to Zack again. Once again, hitting those dwarf questions hard. Has there ever been a dwarf civil war, not including the Chaos Dwarves? Do the Holds war with each other as the Empire Provinces do? And have the Dwarves ever had contact with the Lizardmen apart from Karak Zorn? So, since... So, before the War of Vengeance, um, there... So, uh, oh, sorry. Not since before the War of Vengeance, no. There has not been a Dwarf Civil War. Before the War of Vengeance, there have been some very hot nasty situations between some of the different dwarf realms and they were wealthy and powerful enough that they could afford to have essentially civil wars and uh, fight each other hey chloe um but since the war of vengeance concluded no there has not been a dwarf civil war they they know they can't afford to do that um chaos dwarves yeah they fought them but obviously that doesn't count chaos dwarves are basically a different species at this point um very rarely there are sometimes grudges between holds that will devolve to the point of violence between two holds. But never, 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 never on an imperial scale. Um, only on like a clan scale. But even then, dwarves killing dwarves is a big no-no in dwarf culture um, since the War of Vengeance. I mean, even before the War of Vengeance, it was heavily frowned upon. But it could happen. Um, but... Um, in the modern times, no, no, no. You are not allowed to kill a dwarf if you are a dwarf. Except for very extreme circumstances. Um, and no. Uh, apart from dwarven explorers, they have never had contact with the lizardmen. Um, uh, the, the dwarven realms have never had official contact with the lizardmen empire. Alright. Uh, Martin Tominen asks, Dwarf questions! In Warhammer Age of Reckoning, there were steam locomotives in the underway, of so I've heard, that are used in limited capacities but are said to have fallen much out of use due to the overwhelming amount of enemies there. Is that all part of the main canon or is that something just made up for the game? Also, another question, what information on the Guardians slash Golems do we have and from what sources? I have a hard time finding the info on them since I don't have all the Dwarf Army books or novels. Okay, so in so the Age of Reckoning... Specifically, the locomotives are not canonical. Those are not canon creations. Um, the the Warhammer Online universe has a number of changes from the main, like the, the original main universe that we know and love. Um, that being said, there are steam engines in the Dwarf Empire. Um, and there was one super famous Dwarf steam engine that was supposed to be like a large drill but it was basically modified to be like a pseudo steam tank and it uh it was customized and outfitted with weaponry and made a very very dangerous journey from karazakarak to the norskan dwarf holds it basically like just plowed a path through the world's edge mountains till it got to the very tippy top and then went to the norskan holds um that occurred in one of the really old army books. I want to say it was like the 6th edition dwarf army book. Maybe 7th. And then the runic guardians. So the runic guardians of the Dawi are super rare. But they do exist. They are 100% canon. Unfortunately the magic. Um, the, the magic that's required to power them. Is very very rare nowadays. And to make things worse, the knowledge of how to operate and make the golems has been lost to time. Um, that being said, there have been a couple of Dwarven Guardians that have popped up in, like, official stories. Um, so, for instance, one of the really, uh, one of, like, the, a uh, one that has, like, a ton of details on it that's really fun is uh, in the very recently released Warhammer Fantasy uh, roleplay fourth edition starter set um there are um if you get the starter set it comes with like a booklet of adventures for uh your like starting players and starting gm to attempt and one of them has a uh one of them has a runic golem of the dwarves that you can actually fight uh it's like a boss um though the only reason it functions is because it's been like tinkered with by a human engineer if i remember right but you can actually fight it, which is really fun and cool. Um, uh, and then if you want in a like traditional lore book, 
if you read the War of Vengeance trilogy from the Black Library, uh, I won't spoil how the storyline goes, but there is a significant storyline involving the runic golems of the dwarves. Um, because obviously the dwarves could have like really used them in that war. Uh, let's see. Adam Beline asks, since there are Dawi that are imperial citizens, what is the highest rank one is made in imperial so society, like general or treasurer? Second question. Are there any significant dwarven settlements in the middle mountains? Uh, keep up the good work. I thoroughly enjoy your content. So uh, during the... So the highest rank that I know of that dwarves have attained is during the incredibly corrupt reign of Boris Goldgather, the emperor, um, which is also when the Black Plague was unleashed on humanity by the Skaven. Emperor Boris came to rely heavily on the dwarves as his like muscle um what he essentially did is he employed the dawi as his tax collectors uh, to fatten up his own coffers as much as possible and the dawi were ridiculously ruthless at their job because the dawi did not give a crap what your excuse was um they would collect um although the the dawi in the end did end up turning on him uh because he was a jerk and the thing about dwarves is they can be very strict to the letter of an agreement, which came to uh, backfire on Boris in the end. So uh, if you want to read about them, uh, you can pick up the Black Plague trilogy. Um, but that's probably the highest rank dwarves have ever attained is that they were basically the personal tax collectors of the emperor himself. And they had a ton of authority. Um, as for dwarf settlement in the middle mountains, uh, yeah, every... Every mountain range in the uh, Warhammer Fantasy Universe has dwarf, uh, let's see, middle mountains. If you're referring to the mountain range that's in the center of the empire, like um, up in like Reichland or over by Sylvania, then no, there are not any dwarf holds there. There used to be um, a super long time ago, but not anymore. Like, uh, for instance, um, there used to be a dwarf hold beneath Mindenheim, um, but it's gone now. Um, that's always been kind of a weird one because, like, there, it was like a functioning dwarf hold, and then there were a lot of disagreeing lore stories about if it was still functioning or not. But um, for the most part, it is no longer functioning, like, it's dead, but there was a dwarf hold beneath it. Um, uh, though I would not recommend ever going down there because it's, like, super dangerous. Um, then we've got, they call me cold. Good old cold. What is the glittering realm? How did the ancestors get there? And is Crag the Grim the best rune lord? Or is it Thoric Ironbrow? Okay, so, uh, I'm going to answer the easier question first. Um, so when it comes to Thoric versus Crag, Thoric is the mightiest rune lord without question. When it comes to like the battlefield and matters involving anvils of doom and their use. Um, but Crag is the oldest and has the most knowledge of rune work. So if you were to ask like a rune lord who is more like powerful or who's the best rune lord. They would say that Crag is easily the best rune lord. Um, but the thing about Crag is Crag... The Grim was never super duper famous as like a, a rune lord on the battlefields. He seemed like he was more of an academic or more of like a um, smith or researcher. And um, like we never really hear about his exploits in battle that much. And uh, that's like what Thoric, Thoric's bread and butter is going to war. Um, so I would say who's the best... In like a sense of who would you want in your army? Thoric Ironbrow. Who is the best rune lord and what that job generally entails? Crack the Grim. And then the Glittering Realm. Okay, so the Glittering Realm is this super mysterious, um, difficult, or super mysterious, not thoroughly explained dimension almost. So according to the Lord of the Dwarves, um, the Glittering Realm is essentially a alternate world that the ancestor gods either discovered or were crafted in. It's unclear. Um, 
Most stories agree that the ancestor gods discovered the Glittering Realm. And according to legend, the Glittering Realm is where, like, um, Grogni went into the Glittering Realm and he discovered the secrets of Runecraft. And he discovered a lot of, like, the super important ancient knowledge of the dwarves in the Glittering Realm. So, what is it? Um, it is From what the evidence suggests, I believe that the Glittering Realm is essentially either... It, it is a space either created or designed by the Old Ones. So, the Old Ones... The old ones had these had this super mind boggling crazy technology, right? Um, they could do crazy crap like st create gateways that would allow you to step through it, and it would teleport you halfway across the universe in a single step, no problem. Um, like tr you know, connecting um, mentally or traveling physically across the Warhammer planet was like n a no brainer for them. You know, creating pocket dimensions was easy for them. You know, they were able to reach down to the the bed of the ocean and raise up Ultholon as an island and make it float on literally nothing but magic like that like you know they can move the planet's trajectory um so that it rotated closer you know it rotated closer around the sun to warm it up no problem they were able to create life no problem um you know the old ones are insane uh, technologically um and skill wise and we know for a fact that the old ones created the lizardmen, the slon, or well, obviously the slon are included in that, but they created the lizardmen, then they created the elves, then they created the dwarves. And when they created the dwarves, what we understand about it is that they specifically designed the dwarves to be creatures that were resistant to magic. And because of that, they seem to have formed them of the earth. You know, the dwarves have a very innate connection to the earth because they seem to have literally been born of it. Um, at least in some sense. Because magic affects them like it does the earth. They naturally ground and dissipate it in their own bodies. But after they were created, the first of the dwarves, or at least the first of one in their race was completed, um, discovered something called the Glittering Realm, which was this golden mystical pocket dimension of sorts that was a place that contained all the knowledge the dwarves required um, to become as they were meant to be because the old ones were nice enough that if their creations weren't what they were desired they didn't just like wipe them out they just kept working on them so like they created the elves and were like and eh, the elves aren't really what we want but they still told lord croak to go teach the elves how to make magic and the lizardmen still defended them and created a paradise for them and then they went to the doors and they created the doors and they were like, ah, the doors aren't really what we wanted either. But they still guided Grugni, um, Valea. Uh, they still guided the ancestor gods into the glittering realm and um, taught them the secrets of runecraft and taught them all of the knowledge they needed to know. So when the ancestor gods returned to the dwarves, they were no longer just dwarves. They were something other. They were... They were like first generation Slon to regular Slon. They were these beings of incredible power and knowledge who passed down all of the, what they had learned and what their people were designed to do to the dwarves. Um, and, you know, dwarves didn't become like normal until like the 8th or 10th generation past the ancestor gods. Like even Snorri Whitebeard, a.k.a. Grombrindle, he was like basically considered the first he's the first descendant of grogni who could be considered normal ish and that he didn't have like godlike powers but he was still really weird for a dwarf and that he lived for like a thousand years um and he was the first high king of the dwarves but he was grogni's son um so i guess technically two generations because um snorri whitebeard's sons were pretty normal but um as far as dwarves go but uh so I would say, and how did the ancestors get there? They were meant to go there. I mean, if they weren't created in the Glittering Realm, which is totally possible, then they were just guided there. You know, the old ones had the ability to easily just speak in your mind, and they were unfathomably powerful beings who were said, who were said to be so incredibly potent and powerful that standing in their presence would cause, like, your brain to... Because it would just, like, go crazy. Because Lord Croak was the... Um, Lord Croak and the first generation Slon were the only Slon capable of being in the direct presence of the Old Ones 
with like no issues um and like talking to them so it may be that the dwarves went into the glittering realm and that's how the old ones communicated the knowledge they wanted the dwarves to have um so that they could become the best that they could in there um beyond that what happened to the glittering realm after that is uh, essentially um the dwarves because I, I i i'm i if i remember right grogni discovered it but that could be wrong it might have been his son uh morgrim um the the because they're because although grogni is when, whenever you look at dwarves and you read about the ancestor gods if you look at it at a super basic level you, if you ask me, who are the god of the dwarves? I'll tell you the ancestor gods. And you're saying, okay, who are the ancestor gods? If I'm just trying to like get us through it, I'm going to say Grogni, Valea, um, Grimnir. Stop. That's not technically true. There is actually a larger pantheon. Um, you have you have Morgrim, um, Gazul. You have Morgrim, who's like the really specific god of runecrafting. You have Gazul, who is the god dwarven god of death. Um, you have a couple of like, um, the, the, the main ancestor gods are those three and they're like top dogs. And then their kids were also ancestor gods. Most of them. Snorri Whitebeard was not considered an ancestor god, but he was crazily powerful enough that he lived for a thousand years and which is very old for super old for a dwarf. That's like t beyond twice what they normally live. And then on top of that. He returned from the dead when Malekith broke his promise. Um, so, you know, obviously he's not normal. But um, you have all these ancestor gods. And I, I can't remember if Grungni was the one who discovered the Glittering Realm or if it was Morgrim. But one of them did. And um, that's where they picked up their super important knowledge, which was runecrafting. Um, which is, of course, how to manipulate magic. And uh, in the end, the Glittering Realm kind of function is where the Ancestor Gods went. According to Dwarven history, or myth, I should say myth specifically. According to Dwarven myth, when the Ancestor Gods left the Dwarves, after they basically taught them everything they needed them to know, um, when the war against Chaos ended, the Elves created the Vortex, and they unleashed the Vortex, which drained a lot of the magic out of the world. And it seems that without that magic, the Ancestor Gods weren't able to function or they reached a point where they decided they were no longer needed and they left until their time to return came. So like Grimner went north and ended up holding a gate closed against the forces of chaos and actually played a significant role in how the dwar or how the elves were able to seal the vortex because he actually held back a lot of the demons of chaos by himself because he's a badass but then like grungni and valea and all of the other ancestor gods they went to the glittering realm so they basically went to this like pocket dimension and they left and they uh left the dwarves to their own machinations and we would not really see them ever again valea of course we saw in the end times but we didn't actually get to see her it was more like she was discovered in like a form of stasis but before the doors could wake her up, she, uh, of course, gets devoured by Nagash. Which is kind of a bummer. Um, <laughs> so hopefully that answers that. Uh, Demon Dave asks, Are there any type of special ceremonies like coming of age, marriage, strongest warrior, etc.? Uh, yes, a bunch, actually. Um, the dwarves have several ceremonies that take place in their culture. The most important one by far, however is one they must all go through, which is their coming-of-age ceremony. This ritual is, without a doubt, the most closely guarded sacred ceremony a Dawi will ever experience in their life. And as such, nothing about what it is has ever been recorded, um, lest it you know fall into improper hands. And when I say has never been recorded, I literally mean to the extent that there is not even a single lore story that goes... that that even touches on what it's about like we don't know anything about it um uh they they reference it in a really old uh role play book for the warhammer fantasy second edition called oh gosh i think that was also called masters of stone and steel um something like that or sons of stone and steel something like that but um in that book they they talk a lot about it's most of it's outdated unfortunately 
but they talk a lot about cultural stuff that has not been directly contradicted or retconned, so it's still relatively correct. And one of the things they talk about is the coming of age ceremony, but they don't give any details. Um, the the second most important ceremony off the top of my head would be that whenever a new infant is born, um, there is a bunch, there's a big ceremony where all the blessings of Valea are given to the child. And um, there are, of course, uh, but their culture mirrors ours in many ways because one of the things about the Warhammer universe is that the culture of the men of the empire is a bastardization of dwarven culture. Like everything that the men of the empire are, they kind of sort of learned from the dwarves because the dwarves had a significant guiding factor on the 12 tribes of men that would become the empire. So because of that, um, there's a lot of similarities between our world's cultures and the dwarves cultures because Obviously, the Empire of Men are based on our world, and they are based on the dwarves. So, you know, there's kind of a connection there. So they have ceremonies for marriage. They have ceremonies for ascension. Whenever a new thane or lord, like, earns a title or, like, ascends to a certain rank or becomes king, um, there are tons of ceremonies to commemorate ancient woes or victories. Uh, for instance, if you read the short novel or novella uh, Thorgrim, you get to see a bit of the ceremony at Carrick Eight Peaks. They have what's called uh, Remembrance Day, which is basically when they, uh, one day every year, they have a kind of a festival and they go over, they, they uh, basically they do a read through of the fall of Carrick Eight Peaks um, from the Carrick Eight Peaks Book of Grudges. And it's like a super big deal. Um, or actually, I think it's the Book of Remembrance, but whatever. Um, then they also, but you have other ritual ceremonies too. Like there's there's the famous, uh, I think they call it like the the trouser leg ritual, which is a ceremony that if a member of the engineers guild basically super donks up, like they they invent something that causes harm to someone, or it is like a total failure and it brings shame to the engineers guild, you will be kicked out. And you, uh, but before you're kicked out of the engineers guild, you have to perform something called like the trousers leg ritual. It's like the trouser leg or trousers leg. It's something like that. But you have to perform this super embarrassing ritual. And it is apparently one of the most indignant, shameful experiences a dwarf can experience. And another, it's unfortunately another one of those that there is no details about. Um, they just, <laughs> they just like, it's mentioned a bunch whenever dwarf engineers come up but i've never read of it actually being written out what it is they kind of leave it to the imagination which i hate when they do that but you know some people like that um and then of course there's like the slayer ritual taking the slayer oath whenever a dwarf suffers great shame they they basically uh slayer taking the slayer oath is basically declaring yourself as dead um like you know you you are shaved of your honor and your, um, your family name, your clan, your actual name. In many cases, most slayers don't tell you their names. Um, and you, you're you basically treated as dead. And you are, most dwarves will ignore you. And all this other stuff. And it's like a really big ceremony. Um, which, of course, you can learn all about that in the Go Trek and Felix series. Um, I think that's good for that. So let me just uh, yeah okay those will answer that uh then we have cube who ask who are the dwarves in the spine of sotek they are not canon they don't exist <laughs> there there are no significant dwarven cultures in lustria uh the spine of sotek dwarves are just kind of there but lore wise no they're not those those are not a thing um i am i am 99.9 percent .9 certain of that <laughs> there maybe there's like a small thing but uh there, there are dwarven explorers who maybe have set up like a camp or something along those lines, but there's not like a, there's not a hold up there. But I like them being there because when I play Lizardman campaigns, I like being able to interact with all of the other races. Uh, Acolyte of Nagash asks, um, did the dwarves ever try their hands on building automatons of any kind? If yes, why not make a ton of automatons to be cannon fodder for their armies and spare any dwarves from dying in battle by droves? Um, yes, they did make them. They're called Ancestor Guardians, a.k.a. Golems. Um, unfortunately, to create 
an automaton requires maddening levels of runecraft and power and magic so there's not enough magic with the vortex active there's not enough magic in the world to power them anymore and the dwarves have not figured out how to create clockwork soldiers um, that would require insane levels of innovation like the empire has figured out how to create automatons um, the empire has invented clockwork horses which are often ridden by master engineers um, and then of course they have they have a bunch of little clockwork inventions but they haven't figured out how to like mass produce clockwork soldiers but that's an empire thing um but the best automatons belong to the tomb kings tomb kings have figured out how to make automatons uh, well they knew how to make them i should say <laughs> they don't make anymore um the ones that they still can make have spirits inside them so they're not like true automatons but some of the uh spirits like necrosphinxes the, those are legit automatons for the most part and the tomb kings have no idea how they work but they got made somehow um as far as the tomb kings are concerned they literally just popped up and the tomb kings are really scared of necrosphinxes misha my favorite mod how did the doors manage to survive for so long given their lack of progress when it comes to technology in the same line how come they've been able to make gyrocopters and such when they hate advancing too fast with their technology in the first place so gyrocopters have existed for hundreds of years by this point but it is only recently that they've become kind of acceptable to see them in battle and the main reason for that is that thorgrim grudgebearer the current high king has been pressing really hard for the engineers guild to like chill out and start accepting um innovations like thorgrim has been pressing the iron to the various engineering guilds trying to get them to get over themselves and to start advancing because he realizes that they need to get their crap together and that's why there were a rather sudden increase in innovations like we saw the creation of the drake guns which are of course made by uh which are a the feats of the uh engineering guild teaming up with the uh runesmithing guilds um and then uh gyrocopters gyro bombers stuff like that but like gyrocopters and gyro bombers um the first ones or like their predecessors were being created during the war of vengeance and were being tested um that's when like we saw the first war zeppelins of the dwarves unleashed which went horribly i might add um they were actually created very very well but there were some shenanigans but um the 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 dwarves uh, the reason they've survived so long is because to be quite frank and vulgar ancient dwarves like the most ancient dwarves were fucking terrifying um primor like the the earliest ancestors of the dwarves were capable of some of the most maddening insane feats that anyone has ever seen um like <laughs> dwarves are the ultimate example of a race that when they were designed they were terrifying and they were in their prime when they were like ancient the dwarves have been on a downhill slope ever since um so the way that they have like uh held in there is that literally they've been relying on the the work of the ancients they've been standing on the so shoulders of giants as the saying goes um for ages um because like i said in a prior video the, the dwarves have not the dwarves have almost entirely been designed around the idea of trying to retain and relocate lost knowledge as acquired to acquiring new knowledge only the engineers guild is all about actually innovating and even then they really struggle with it hopefully that answers that uh and that'll be it for this video so thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, we'll be back with more questions tomorrow. See you.